you have your Bibles open this morning, Daniel chapter number one, Daniel chapter number one, and last week we talked about the uh, conformity that the world, the culture against us is trying to uh, do to us. They're trying to change our history, our heritage. They're trying to change uh, our faith, our values. They're trying to change our very identity and the identity of, of who we are as believers in Jesus Christ. And here in our text, we, we see uh, from last week, these boys along with uh, Daniel are in a new location. They're, they got new education, a new diet, new culture, new language, um, and uh, ultimately, the new names. And so here they are. Um, 25 centuries have come and gone, and really nothing has changed. The world is still trying to do that to us today. Salt stings, light burns the eyes. And so the answer of the world to us as Bible believers is to pull down the shades and water down the salt or get rid of it because salt that salt stings. If salt loses its sting and loses its savor, the Bible says, it sends forth good for nothing but to be cast out and trod under the foot of men. Uh, so certainly the world does not like what we bring as believers. If you're here this morning and you're saved by the grace of God, the Spirit of God dwells in you and bears witness uh, to a dark world. And anybody who wakes up in the middle of the night and you try to look at your phone to see what time it is and you know that light, I don't care how low you got it turned down, uh, it, 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 it bugs you. I mean, it hurts at first time. And certainly the effect that we have on this world is similar and, uh, and they don't like it and Satan doesn't like, doesn't like it and so they're trying to change uh, who we are. And we see the attack comes to all ages. Certainly young people, I think, are, are more under the microscope, more vulnerable to this attack. And certainly Daniel was young and a teenager and uh, so the world starts young, and we would do well to take heed from the world's philosophy and start young. Start bringing, uh, and, and don't make your children bring you. You bring your children. Amen. And uh, come to church, you ought to be faithful. There ought not ever be a question, you know, whether you're going or not. You ought to, you ought to be faithful. And these, uh, these men were used to doing what's right, brought up in a home that done right. And uh, we see... Uh, here, Daniel in verse 8, and we've preached down through verse 7, but in verse 8, we see a, a choice that Daniel made, and, and certainly choices are very, very, very important. And, um, and by the way, choices are what makes up a life. And we live in a culture that says, you know what? Crime is a disease. Can I tell you? Can I bust your bubble for a moment? Crime is not a disease. In the 1950s, a psychologist named Stanton, same now, uh, and a psychologist, Samuel Yokelson, shared the, this convention that crime was, was caused by the environment, so they set out to prove their, their point. And they began a 17-year study involving thousands of hours of clinical testing, over 250 inmates in the District of Columbia they tested, and to their astonishment, they discovered that the cause of crime cannot be traced to environment, poverty, oppression. Instead, crime is a result of individuals making wrong moral choices. Now, do some people have better advantages than others? Absolutely. Do some people have a better start at life than others? Absolutely. But at the end of the day, we make our choices and we're responsible for the consequences. My, my, my soul was writhing as I, as I seen. And uh, this, this young girl recently killed in South Carolina and um, murdered. She got in the wrong car. She thought it was an Uber, and it was not the Uber driver. And she got in the car and was killed. 21 years old, student at South Carolina University. And she, that person that killed her, obviously made a very, very terrible, tragic, unfathomable decision to take her life. It wasn't a mistake. It was, a, it was a decision. He made a decision, and he should pay for the consequences of that decision. And I don't know all the details, but just reason would stand 
if you were to say, you know, the girl probably had no business not, not to, you know. And by the way, don't ever blame the other party for your wrongdoing. So I'm not saying because she was out at 2 o'clock in the morning, this guy had a right to kill her. No, 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 no. Just because the TV was sitting at your curb don't mean it's yours. That's like kids growing up. Well, it was just there. It wasn't nobody's. Oh, yes, it is. And the famous line from father is this. I used to tell them, they'd say, well, daddy, I didn't see nobody. It wasn't no name on it. You got a name on all your toys? No. And uh, so just nobody, it was just sitting. I just found it. That's classic. I found it. And uh, so, so we go back to, is it yours? No, sir. Okay, then. It's not yours. Don't matter where it was. If it's not yours, it's not yours. So just because Walmart leaves something in a buggy out in front of the store don't mean you take it, and that's just their mistake. No, it's called stealing. We live in this culture that wants to blame everybody, and if somebody makes an unfortunate mistake, then we ought to take advantage of it. Absolutely not. Amen. Right, still right. No matter how blurry our culture tries uh, to make it, uh, but, you know, choices have consequences. And so as I was saying, uh, you know, she made a choice to stay out till 2 o'clock in the morning. I don't think it was a good choice. It's her right to stay out as long as she wants to. But obviously she may have had some other, some other things going. And again, I'm not blaming her for getting murdered. But I'm just saying all choices have consequences. All choices have consequences. And, and we, we deliberate over some choices that are not so serious. And uh, we, we had a couple of days for spring break, and uh, Luke wanted to go back to Boone, and we went last year to Boone. And I'm not too, I'm on TV here, but I'm not too crazy about Boone. Amen. And just the whole representation of that area is not necessarily what I represent, and so I'm not crazy about it. I'll just be honest and transparent. And, but, you know, there's mountains there. And that, pretty, that covers a lot of multitude of sins. Mountains does, right? <laughs> and, so, and so he said, I want, and here was his motive. I knew what his motive was before he ever went. Last year we went and went to a place called Daniel Boone Inn and ate. And so that was the whole, when he thinks of Boone, there's only one place he thinks of. Is the, well, actually two, Mellon Mushroom where we ate and Daniel Boone Inn. And that's the only two places he thinks of. You know, that is Boone, like Daniel Boone in. That's, that's, you know, so we got to go. And so, and so we, we, we went there, and uh, Daniel Boone in, so we get there, and here's a great discussion. I mean, this was a family-type discussion, all eyeballs on board. We're looking at each other, I mean, like serious time. I mean, right here, this is it. It's not what you're going to eat because they, they give you what you're going to eat, fried chicken, mashed potatoes, green beans, them old country biscuits, you know, that don't come out of a can. They're not all uniform. And um, with ham in the middle of them, it was terrible. It's not good to talk about this before lunch. <laughs> but, like, they, th they put all that out. And, um, and so the, really the only decision you have is water or tea. And then at the end, you have this decision. Here's the big one. This is what we spent many minutes of deliberation on. Strawberry shortcake. Chocolate cake or peach cobbler. Those are the three choices. You'd have thought this was like the world trade wars. And so I made it easy for him. I said, I said, okay. And Luke got strawberry shortcake last time. And I said, Luke, that's going to look good, but it ain't going to taste as good as that chocolate cake. I know about food. And he went by looks. The, chocolate, the strawberry always looks better, right? It's got more color and all that, but it wasn't, wasn't that great. And he got it last time. He come in the door. He says, I know what I'm getting this time. I said, what? He said, the chocolate. <laughs> I said, okay. So mama got peach cobbler, and I, I ordered chocolate cake, but I didn't eat one bite of it. Aren't you proud of me? Not one bite. So I said to them, I said, well, okay, Luke, what, what, what do you want me to get? He said, how about you get chocolate cake too? <laughs> 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 and so we got chocolate cake. Now, we laugh about it. And those decisions sometimes take more time than they probably should, but they were fun. It was a fun decision. But that's about as light as it gets. Do you know most every decision we make in life has repercussions? 
You know that big old oak tree you see down at your property or the neighbor's property or maybe somebody else, you go for a stroll and you see that it didn't start like that. It started with an acorn, a small thing. You know, many people who make decisions, it, it doesn't start big. It starts, it starts very, very small. And so it did for these, uh, these men. Look in verse 8, if you would, in chapter 1 of Daniel. But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with a portion of the king's meat, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore, he requested of the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. I want to give you the anatomy of choices this morning, the anatomy of choices. What should, and actually not just choices, the anatomy of a spiritual choice. What would a spiritual choice look like? Number one, I want to show you this morning, the choice was premeditated. It was premeditated. Uh, we live in a day of, of compromise. We live in a day, we live in a world of compromise. Everybody around you, uh, you know, from, from, uh, from the time of life, we began. We, we learned the art of compromise all uh, uh, the way through our life. We usually, for the most part, we go the line of least resistance. Let's be honest. Most of the time, if we have a choice of, of uh, least resistance, that's what we take. And uh, oftentimes, we hold a conviction until it gets in the way of our comfort or our ease. Many times we double down on something, a Bible principle, until it comes to our comfort. Until it invades our comfort, uh, then we, we stay with it. But if, you know, if, we can, uh, if we can do something to, to get around that, oftentimes uh, we do. We have a standard as long as it doesn't violate something else we want to do. We set a standard and as long as it doesn't violate something we want to do, it's fine. It's a wonderful standard. But I want to tell you, we, we have divine principles that we cannot cheat on, and they're given in God's word. And may God help us not to, not to change our decisions based uh, on what's going on around us. But the key to the passage in verse number 8, I want you to look at it. Daniel purposed in his heart. This was not a knee-jerk decision. Good decisions are premeditated. This morning, I want to I encourage you. I don't care what age you are, what stage of life you're in. You may be coasting in the sunset years of your life. You may be middle-aged with kids. I don't care what stage, maybe a teenager, maybe a young person. I don't care what stage you're in. You need to make sure and make a list of principles, preferably Bible principles, that you're going to live by. Decisions need to be premeditated. You don't have time. Daniel didn't have time to go back to a manual. He didn't have time to look back at something. He didn't have time to research. He didn't have time to Google it. He, it was a premeditated decision already established long ago. Thank God for his godly parents uh, who helped him come to that conclusion through godly training, but it was premeditated. Now, I want to say, young couples, don't wait till your children are teenagers to decide what path you're going to take with your teenagers. It's too late at that point. So choices, spiritual choices are usually premeditated. Don't decide when the boss comes and asks you if you want to go to this party with a, with a group and you know there's going to be uh, folks just falling out drinking there. Don't wait till the night of the Christmas thing to decide. Good decisions are premeditated. Usually I find out decisions that are wrong are not premeditated. They're knee-jerk. They're based on something, and we'll get to that in just a moment. I'll never forget as a teenager, and just had gotten saved, I had my license, and, they, and these boys invited me to a birthday party. I just got my license, so I, I was kind of feeling things out, went to a public high school, and, um, you know, I didn't understand what all happened at birth. Like, usually when you go from you know, 13, you know, birthday parties are tame and good. But something happens when, when you get on about 16, the parties are not the same. Parents, you might want to take note of that. And it's probably going a lot before that now. <laughs> but so we go to this birthday party, and, and uh, I didn't see any cake or candles, Brother Chris. <laughs> There wasn't any birthday cake, no candles. I thought, well, what kind of birthday party is this? And, man, there's people walking up down the road and cars everywhere. 
And I go sit down and there's cougars everywhere. Now granted, I just had gotten saved and uh, I grew up, my, my dad drank till he got born again and he didn't drink anymore. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. He didn't go through a 12-step step program. I'm not against training and all that. But when he got saved, he quit it. Well, he didn't have it as bad as I got it. I disagree. God changed his appetite. Right. Right. Amen. So I knew about alcohol, not gloatingly, but I knew about, you know, that environment. That wasn't why I was going. I was going to hang out with my buddy. I wanted to be, you know, I wanted people to like me. We all, we all have a desire to have friends, don't we? I mean, there was no Bible club at North Davidson High School in 1989. And so I, I wanted to hang out. And then the guy that I was going to see, he, he went to a church, and I won't tell you the name of it, but he was a leader in that church. It's downtown. Anyway, moving on. And uh, so I, I show up to this party, and I sit down. I just sit down on the bench. I mean, I hadn't even sit down. And somebody passes me a beer. Says, here, you want this? I said, no, I don't do that. And there's no shame in saying that. And so I got up. I went there alone. I left alone. I got up and walked out. The birthday boy was coming down the road with a beer in his hand. He said, where are you going? I said, I'm going home. I'll see you. And I never went back. What if we took that first drink? Just the first one. It's not that big of a deal, right? No, it is. Every alcoholic alive had to take one, the first one, sometime. Every heroin addict had to take the first. The first. The first matters. This was a premeditated decision. Daniel didn't wait. And, uh, and listen, at work, even gossip, even decisions about what we're going to do at work and how we're going to stand, and what, our ethics, just the way we handle ourselves, the way we carry ourselves. And gentlemen, the way you carry yourselves at work around the opposite sex and how we carry ourselves and handle ourselves, those are not decisions to be made on the fly. Those are decisions that need to be premeditated. And Daniel here sets a wonderful pattern this was a premeditated decision. Life is a series of choices. As the mighty oaks from small acorns grow, we make our decisions, and our decisions turn around and make us. Our decisions develop you. You are today uh, who you are because of decisions and choices you made years ago. And sometimes that's good, and sometimes that's not good. And most of the time, we don't realize how small choices, how big they really are. Especially true uh, in the, during the teenage years of our life. Most people that get saved get saved uh, before they're 18 years old. Almost 80% of the people that get saved get saved before they're 18. Choices. Choices. We, we all have them, and you are today. Uh, many of life's important decisions are made in the teenage years. Where are you going to college? What will you major in? Who are you going to marry? Are you going to get married? What career are you going to choose? Uh, who will be your friends? And uh, what are you going to do? What are you going to watch? What are you going to do for entertainment? What are you going to do here? What are you going to do there? And you, you make the decisions. And, and will you keep yourself to the marriage altar? There are things, decisions that we make early on that shape who we are. And uh, you say, I'm, I'm just kind of, I'm kind of a middle of the road kind of guy, Pastor. Well, that's interesting. Most accidents happen in the middle of the road. <laughs> Those who follow the crowd are quickly lost in it, someone said. Somebody said this, compromise makes a good umbrella, but a poor roof is temporarily expedient. I mean, you know, we need to, we need to make sure that we're making the right decisions, and those decisions will not be made at the moment. You, you don't wait till that boss tries to get you to do something crooked uh, before you do it. You make a decision now, make a decision this morning. If you're a child of God, I'm making a premeditated decision. I'm going to be honest in my business dealings. I'm making a premeditated decision that I'm going to wait till I get married. 
I'm making a premeditated decision that we're going to go to church. I got. I'm making a premeditated decision uh, that I'm going to do right. I, I got a, a premeditated decision that our children are going to do this and they're going to do that and we're going to do this as a family. Those are not. Those are not made uh, in the. Uh, you know, just in the spur of the moment. Those are made in the secret place. Those are made uh, in the prayer closet. They're not made when you get before the king. They're made when you're before the king of kings and the Lord of Lords in the prayer clause and you say oh God help me protect me Daniel made this decision long before he traipsed down to Babylon and stood before King Nebuchadnezzar he had already stood before the almighty God in heaven and said hey God I want to do what's right and you helping me I'm going to make the right choices and the right decisions we need some men and women of God some young people some grandparents some parents who will do right this morning and make a premeditated decision to do what's right in your choices. We have them every day. You have choices every day and sometimes we, uh, we, we want to dumb down the fact that we have choices. No, you have choices every day. You men have choices. You women have choices. Young people, we all have choices to make. And there needs to be some lines drawn, premeditated. His choice was premeditated. And sooner or later, we'll, we'll face the most important decision of all, and that is, will I follow Jesus Christ? Will I follow Jesus Christ? Do you know him as your Savior this morning? There's only two, two roads to take, heaven or hell, concerning your soul. That's the most important decision you'll ever make, is to trust Jesus Christ as your Savior. And you know, that's one decision I've never regretted. I've never, I've never wondered, did I do the right thing when I trusted Jesus Christ? It's not been easy, but it's been good. It's not been, it's not been a, a bed of roses, but it's been sweet. It's been wonderful walking with the Lord. And, uh, you know, that's a decision I never regret making. His choice was premeditated. Here they are in Babylon. They've been torn away from their families uh, in Jerusalem by King Nebuchadnezzar and now in front of the mighty Babylon army and uh, these men came from noble backgrounds. The king picked them out. He handpicked these men. They didn't have a physical blemish. They were sharp young men and they were trained to enter the service. Uh, these were God-fearing uh, Jewish teenagers and uh, then they, they tried to indoctrinate them. They gave them the best education Babylon had to offer for three years. They were immersed in the Babylonian knowledge, culture, history, and language, and religion. And uh, they were aimed for some high-level government position. His choice was premeditated. And everything appears to be going smoothly until verse 8. But Daniel purposed. It was premeditated. He said, you know what? I'm not, I'm not going along with this. This is crucial in his life. Although it might not have appeared important at the time, uh, what Daniel did shaped the next 60 years. Parents, let me say to you, it matters how we train our children. Those decisions, those seemingly insignificant things, decisions about who they go out with and who they spend the night with and where they go for the weekend and whose house they go over to and all. They seem just like trite, quick decisions. I want to tell you, they're not trite and insignificant. They could shape the very fabric of your family. Every decision as a family matters. Every decision as a man, as a woman, as a young person, every decision we make matters. And Daniel was faced with the biggest decision of his life that would shape the next 60 years. And Daniel's decision sometimes appears, I mean, just quite frankly, appears odd to us. I mean, we're not Jews living in captivity, so it's hard to us to understand. But I mean, what's all the fuss about the food and the king's table? But this was a big deal. I mean, this was not some little old bitty podunk town. This was Babylon. This was Nebuchadnezzar. I mean, they were in control of the known world. And here Daniel is before him. And I want to say to you uh, this morning, uh, some decisions, they can't be made spur of the moment. And you're going to be faced with stuff at work. They're gonna, your boss is going to ask you to do stuff. Somebody's going to ask you to do stuff. Somebody else is going to uh, petition you. Or, boy, you can, really, you can really climb the ladder this way. Or you can really do this if you just sacrifice this and sacrifice that. Decisions matter. Whether or not you work that uh, time and a half, it matters. The double time, it matters. Sometimes there's times to work that, and sometimes there's time to say, I don't need to do that. 
And uh, it matters. Every decision, every single decision matters. And uh, Daniel here was faced with, with a huge decision. He purposed in his heart, verse 8, that he would not defile himself with a portion of the king's meat. Three quick uh, problems here. This food had not been prepared according to the Old Testament law. Uh, much of it was ritually unclean. Uh, all the wine and the meat would have been offered to pagan gods. All of it. And so, and then Daniel knew that sharing a meal at the king's table, it, it meant you were sharing the king's values. Be careful who you hang out with. Be careful who you endorse. And uh, that's why it's so important, me as pastor, it's not just a decision about what I like and what I don't like and what preachers I have and what preachers. I, I've, very, I've only had one preacher in this church that I had because I really wanted to have him. And we've had at least 20. You know what the basis is? And God put that in my heart to have him. I'm not saying it was an ungodly choice. I'm saying my decisions are made because I want, I want to have the man here that can help you. I don't have preachers here just because I like to hear them preach and we're buddies. I have preachers here who I think can help you. So the understanding of that is our decision has an effect on other people. He understood that endorsing the king sitting at his table. Okay, it may not have been, been a big deal in, in the eyes of those right around. I mean, after all, he's miles and miles and miles from home. Who's going to see him? But when you share a table with somebody, and I, I, I'll be honest, I've shared tables with people that I didn't really want to eat with. How many of y'all are the same way? You're lying if you don't raise your hand. Amen. You've eaten with people. You, but it, it's more who are you hanging out with? It does matter. It does matter. You say, Pastor, it's no big deal. It is a big deal. It is a big deal. Because your children and grandchildren see the decisions that we make and pattern their life thereafter. This was a premeditated decision. And, and number two, it wasn't a decision of a panel. Daniel didn't poll the world or poll Babylon or poll the teenagers. Remember, it's him and his three buddies. That's it. And he didn't poll the world to see what kind of decision uh, he was going to make. And, you know, it's very important that you not, don't, don't poll uh, those people you work with. Those people that are unbelievers at work, don't ask them what you ought to do with your family or with your husband or your wife. Amen. Don't ask them that. You don't poll a pagan crowd for spiritual decisions. Well, I get so burdened down with God's people getting advice from people that have never been born again, never been redeemed, and getting advice on how to do family stuff and how to raise kids and how to treat their husband, how to treat their wife, getting advice from people that have never been regenerated. You don't need pagan advice for spiritual problems and from a spiritual person. So if you, we first need to go back to the Bible. It didn't get spiritual counsel. There's safety in a multitude of counselors. But listen, if you work down at the school, all those teachers don't need to be given input about what you do. Amen. If you work at the factory, all those factory people don't need to be given you advice about how, how, what you should do for your anniversary. You don't, you don't take advice from worldly carnal people to make a spiritual decision. I know the anniversary is not a spiritual decision. Well, for some of you, it might be. It may be do or die for some of you. So it is. But Daniel was putting his life on the line, and he, I mean, he was spoiling his chances. He had, think about this. When Daniel stood, he had no chance of getting advanced. He had no chance of moving up. I mean, in his mind, and by the way, in his mind, it was all, when he made this decision, it was all over. And some of you are trying to navigate things. Well, if I, if I really speak out for Jesus, if I really make a stand, I'm going to lose everything I've worked for and everything I've tried hard to gain and earn. I want to say to you, God took care of every bit of that. We're going to see in a minute. Hey, don't worry about all that. He made it. His decision was premeditated. His choice was not a decision of a panel. You know, sometimes you don't need to panel the world. You don't need to poll Facebook for some of your decisions. Now, if it's about where you go eat tomorrow night, that's fine. <laughs> but don't, don't poll Facebook about how to raise your children. Like, do you believe in discipline? Do you use timeout or do you not use timeout? Don't get quiet right there now. 
You don't poll people. You get in the, get in the Bible. Get in the Bible. And um, number three, his choice wasn't pragmatic. I mean, he, he, didn't, he didn't do it because he didn't base it on what the repercussions were. Again, he could have been cut off from the king. He didn't base it on that. Let me tell you this morning, you don't make decisions based on what's going to happen. Make decisions on whether or not they're right. If they fall in line with the Bible, make right decisions. God will take care of the results. We don't make choices that are pragmatic. His choice was not pragmatic. In other words, it wasn't based on what's going to happen to me if I make this decision. He said, you know what? I don't care what happens to me. He had already made up his mind. We're not eating the king's meat and that you can change my name all you want to and you can give me all this mumbo jumbo education that you want to. You can change my exterior, but you're not changing my heart. We're not going to do it. And we need to make up our minds and, and don't base your decision on who else is. Well, what is so-and-so's family doing? It don't matter. Or their parents let them watch it. What they say about it? It don't matter. Well, what they decide about it? it don't matter. Let's quit basing our decisions on what everybody else is doing. Daniel, if he would have made his decision based on what everybody else is doing, he would have been on his knees before Nebuchadnezzar. Worshiping the false gods, Marduk. But he wasn't. He said, hey, y'all do what you want. It wasn't pragmatic. He didn't poll the crowd. It wasn't a panel. And it wasn't pragmatic. This was a crucial event in his life. And again, it may not have seemed like a big deal, uh, but, but it was a big deal. It was a big deal. And uh, it, it, wasn't, it wasn't about what's going to happen to me. You know, if, if, uh, if, if I do this, I'm going to lose my educational opportunities. Daniel said, who cares? Uh, you know, you just, just keep quiet. You know, maybe somebody at work says, hey, just keep quiet about the Lord. When you get to the top, you, then you can speak a little more about it. His decision wasn't based on all that. You know, sometimes, now, his response to the king, just to, just to let you know, it was the right, I mean, it was right. He responded the right way. It was tactful. It was thorough. It was thought through. He didn't just make some rash statement. He, he, he responded in a good way. And you know you can be right with the wrong attitude. You can have the right position with the wrong disposition. Let's have both. You know you can stand up and be tactful and be reasonable. You may not be able to do this, but there, there may. Think about it. He took another name. And he even submitted to the education he was given. But when, he, when, when they said you need to eat this food that was given to Ireland, he said, whoa, 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 not doing that. And so we need to be reasonable, tactful. I've seen some people lose their testimony because they, they stood for the right thing, but they stood the wrong way. We, we need to stand, but we need to stand the right way. And he didn't use excuses. He didn't say, well, we're in captivity. You know, he, he didn't pragmatize and say, we're in captivity. Nobody's going to see us. I mean, after all, we're already captured. we got to do it. Nebuchadnezzar said we've got to do it. He didn't use all of those excuses. He didn't say, God, God understands, you know, this is a one-time deal and keep his fingers crossed when he was eating it. He didn't make any excuses. He said, I'm not eating it. Sometimes we need to just put away the excuses and say, no, we're not, we're not going to do it. And the Babylonians changed. And number four, I want you to see this. His choice was followed by providence. Look at verse nine. Now God, now God. That's big. Now God. Verse nine adds now God. Suddenly God enters the picture. Isn't it amazing that, that God wanted Daniel to stand before him first and then Providence came in. His choice was followed by providence. It'll hardly ever be preceded by providence. When you're faced with a hot-button decision, church, I want to tell you, often God will not give you that, that you know, fuzzy little feeling. Uh, sometimes you just got to stand up because it's in the Bible. It's a Bible principle. It's God's word. And as soon as Daniel stood up to the king, guess what happened? Verse 9, right there he comes. Now God... Here he comes. 
providence backed up Daniel's decision. You just keep doing right. You say, Pastor, I'm tired of doing right. It's hard to raise kids in this, in this generation we live. It's hard to do right. It's hard to be the husband. It's hard to be the daddy. It's hard to be the wife, the mother that I ought to be. Hey, you just keep doing right. You just keep on making the right decisions. Little by little, you make the right choices. You know they're right. It's not a decision of whether or not we know something's right. We know what's right. We live in the most technologically advanced society we've ever lived in. We know what's right. Let's make those small decisions that are right and then the providential hand of God will come and put his stamp of approval on it. He'll say, hey, that's my son. That's my daughter. You did the right thing and you know what it may be till heaven till we get that stamp of approval. But he got it right away. I mean, as soon as he stepped before Nebuchadnezzar, now God, look at what it says. Verse number nine, look at it. Now God had brought Daniel into favor and tender love with the prince of eunuchs. Does God bless those that honor him? Absolutely, he does. Absolutely, he does. And then Daniel gives him uh, the, the explanation. He gives him what, and I'll just summarize for you, but he gives him a proposal. Basically, you let everybody else eat what they want to eat. We're going to eat pulse and drink water. There's some deliberation about what that pulse means. Sometimes it means vegetables. Sometimes it means like, uh, for lack of better terms, like shredded wheat. <laughs> Whatever it was, it worked. It worked. And he got down to the end of the trial period what happened? They looked better than everybody else. God blessed them. The king found them 10 times smarter than the magicians and the enchanters of the kingdom. They were 10 times beyond and above uh, everybody else. And, uh, I mean, Daniel served. He was a counselor to Babylonian kings for 60 years. He got to be salt and light in a dark world because of one decision that he thought was going to cost him the kingdom. And at the end, when God moved in and showed up, it gave him insight and influence for 60 more years. Just do right. Hey, parents, I know it's tough. Keep doing right. Young people, young married couples, keep doing right. I don't care who's going to the honky-tonks. You don't have to get the wristband. Amen. Hey, that wristband's no symbol of, my, of, of being a man or a woman. You don't have to do you don't have to go to those places. You don't have to cater to worldly environment and entertainment. We don't have to. We can say no. Daniel said no. And I bet uh, somewhere in heaven his parents were screaming, Hallelujah, glory to God. And uh, Daniel said no, and for 60 years he had the influence of the whole nation. God blesses good decisions. He blesses. Good choices. 2,500 years later, we're talking about Daniel because he made the right choice. Listen to me. Make the right decision. Do right. Do right. Make the right decision. I'm going to give you five things about, and just, just real quick, I'm just going to give them to you. Write them down. How to make the right decision. We just looked at it. What, what the anatomy of a, of a spiritual choice his choice was, it was premeditated. It wasn't a decision of the panel. It wasn't pragmatic, and it had the providence of God. But I want to tell you practically how you make those decisions. Number one, does it violate a clear teaching of Scripture? Does it violate a clear teaching of Scripture? If Scripture says it's wrong, it's wrong. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Psalm 119, 105. If it violates a clear teaching of Scripture, guess what? Get away from it. You don't even have to pray about it. Get away from it. Like flea fornication, you don't have to pray about that. You don't have to, you know, no, no, no. I don't care who all's living together today. We live in a culture that's all mixed up. People living together and shacking up, and it's not right. It's not right. And you can sit quiet all you want. It's not right. It's, it's against the Bible. You don't do a test drive relationship to figure out if you want to spend the rest of your life together. You commit to one another before God, and then you start living together. You pick the house out. Amen. All right, moving on. Number two, does it violate my body as a temple of the Holy Spirit? 
Does it violate my body to temple of the Holy Spirit? You're living in barred property. You're living in barred property. It's not yours. It's not mine. If you borrowed a friend's car, uh, you tra- you, hopefully you'd treat it very carefully because it wasn't your car. Somebody else bought the car. Somebody else paid for the repairs on the car. Somebody else filled the gas up on the car. Somebody else paid for the insurance on the car. They paid for the tags on the car and the, the registration on the car, and they loaned it to you. Our bodies were created and purchased by God. We're just stewards of them on the earth. So I ask you the question, is this really how I should treat God's possession? We're not our own. Does it violate my body as a temple? Number three, does it cause another Christian to stumble? Does it cause another Christian to stumble? Number four, does it go against the express will of the authority in my life? How many times have people just listened to their parents and spiritual leaders? And, uh, and that needs to go along with Bible. Anytime a spiritual leader is in description to the Bible, you take the Bible. Amen. But if a spiritual authority in your life or parental authority is giving you advice and it's biblical, take it. Don't just see what they think about it. Take their advice. Number five, does it glorify God? Whether therefore you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. 1 Corinthians 10, 31. You say, Pastor, I've made some mistakes in my life. I'm almost done. Can you give me two more minutes? No. (laughs) I'm going to take two more minutes, all right. You say, Pastor, I've made some bad choices. You know what? We've all made bad choices. Everybody in here, balcony, main floor, Pastor, we've all made bad choices. You say, Pastor, I've, I've blown it. The good news is you've lived to see another day. If you're here this morning without Jesus Christ, first decision you need to make, trust Christ. Don't wait. Today's the day of salvation. Neither is your salvation any other. There's only one, one way to heaven. That's Jesus. He said, I am the way. Jesus is the way. That's the first decision. And then make a decision about your own personal life. About Some of you need to premeditate some decisions. You need to get a sheet of paper out tonight and list things uh, and principles, Bible principles, about things that you won't do and things that you will do as a believer and as a husband, as a father, as a man, as a woman. We need to have, we need to have that down. It needs to be premeditated. But you say, Pastor, I've messed up. I've messed up. I've broken. I've made some bad choices, and I'm paying for it right now. There's a beautiful story, and I close with this story. There was this family in Glasgow, Scotland. They were were in turmoil. After years of rebellion, this daughter finally rejected her parents, her values, their values. She rejected their faith. She set out on her own journey to uh, live life, enjoy life without Restraints. There's no such thing, by the way. But soon she became enslaved by her own liberated choices. Isn't it funny how the world thinks that freedom to make the wrong choices is liberating? No, it's condemning. It's entangling. That's what Satan does. She, she set out to make her own liberated choices and became enslaved to them. Years of misery followed, and she lived on the streets and lived a life of ill repute and depended on rescue missions for survival. And because of this self-imposed detachment from her family, she didn't know that her father had died, her father had passed away, and she didn't even know it because she had been out away from her family, away from God. Nor did she know that her mother had never quit looking for her. One day she saw a picture that her mom had posted in one of the city's homeless shelters. So she goes to this homeless shelter, and she finds a picture of herself in a paper, and, and on the paper it tells about who she is and that her mom was looking for. And, um, and then on there it says this, on the poster it said this. Across the photo, the mother wrote these words, I love you still, come home, come home. In wonder and disbelief, she sat out uh, for her home, she wanted to go back. She thought, Mama loves me. She says, come home, I'm going home. I've had enough of this, I'm going home. And uh, she, she, she went back home hoping her mama still loved her. By the time she arrived, it was in the middle of the night, she came to the door. Her heart was racing, her palms were sweaty, 
and uh, she was on the porch prepared to knock on the door, uh, but her countenance suddenly changed when she tapped the door, and, and it was open, and the door crept open, and she ran into her mother's bedroom in fear that somebody had broken in and harmed her mother, so she ran into the bedroom and uh, to see if something had happened to her mother. She desperately reached for her mom, and her mom awoke quickly, and she was startled, and she uh, quickly embraced her wayward daughter. She woke up and embraced her, and when the young woman expressed her fears about the open door and how that somebody, she thought maybe somebody come in and was going to harm her. Uh, her mother replied, no dear, from the day you left, that door has never been locked. He said, Pastor, I've made a mess in my life. I got good news for you. The door's open. The door's open. Even for those of you that are saved, and you say, you know what? I've saved. I made choices that have affected me and my family. I want. To, I got good news for you. First John one nine. That's the door. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The door's open this morning. The door's open. You can come back. You say, I've made a mess. Hey, let's get it right. Let's get it right. 